Well, here we are. It's Friday. Uh, let's see. August 12, 2022. Summer's about half over, I guess. And I uh, hope you're all having a good summer. I hope everybody's having a great time, enjoying family and friends and doing things that are fun and collecting. Of course, always collecting. <laughs> uh Let's see what's been going on around here. Nothing. The heat broke, finally. We're back down in the 70s where we belong and away from those 100-degree temperatures, which is nice. And uh, we might get some rain someday, I hope. We haven't had rain here for about six weeks. It's pretty wild. Uh, What's been going on in the uh, auction market? Well, a lot of things have been happening. Uh, One of the things, oh, before we get started, I wanted to mention that we've added another uh, catalog for you bronze collectors out there. So if you go to the... uh, <clears throat> you go to the uh, uh, book section on the site, the catalogs and books, and click that. Bring you over here. And, the, and last week we added a, a good a good uh, bit on uh, yawn, uh, blue and white porcelain. And this week we've added the this catalog it's from the uh, Frank Sartz collection that was an exhibition of bronzes. It was done in Hong Kong back in 2011, and it was uh, r- run by Christian Didier the uh, famous uh, French bronze dealer. Um, and if you, if, you, if you go to the uh, 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 catalog section, it's in the upper left. And uh, there's a number of catalogs on here um, from this gallery. They, they publish them. They have been publishing them online off and on. And we grab them. If you go up there and type in bronze, um, you'll pull up uh, a whole bunch of catalogs on, on them. And a number of them are from DDR. Some of them are from Jim Lally. But they have uh, great information in them if you're interested in old bronzes. But uh, this this particular catalog is terrific. It's beautifully illustrated. Uh, it's it got good information. It's in English. Uh, <laughs> and uh, a lot of very, very fine examples with uh, really, really superb photography in them if you... Uh, uh, take a look, and you can you can blow them up and uh, get a good look at them. See the surfaces, the patinas, get a sense of it, and uh, read the information provided. But it's it's, it's quite instructional. It's very good. Uh, and what else is going on here? Oh, we had uh, some good auctions finish. Oh, the uh, global member page video is up now also. Um, last week we didn't get it up uh, until a couple of days after because there wasn't much to talk about, but. Uh, um, we've added this week, and uh, there's some previews on there. There's some good auctions now are turning up, and um, uh, the first big one turned up um, uh, for Europe. Check out the European page, and the American uh, U.S. pages are, are just loaded with stuff right now. It's, it's pretty amazing, uh, so I was glad to see it. Um, getting into some results last week, uh, this was an interesting thing. This was something that was at the John McGinnis sale, and uh, it was on the global pages. Uh, John McGinnis in Amesbury, um, and uh, he had a bu- he had a document auction. And I hope some of you looked at this. This was something that really caught my eye. <clears throat> it's an incredibly rare ship's manifest uh, that turned up. He, it had a fifty to five hundred dollar bid. It went for sixteen thousand dollars. And um, you can you only have to look at it for a little bit to realize why. Uh, it was for a ship, the uh, Atreya, that was one of the very first China trade ships out of uh, Salem that left in 1790, very, very, very early in America's uh, adventures in the China trade within the first year. And the names on this thing are all the people that went on to become uh, very important China trade merchants in America. Uh, uh, and and, and you'll, you'll see the names under shippers or under consignees. And uh, the first one right up the top, of course, is the, uh, the Perkins family, which is one of the oldest China trade families in America. And if you scroll down a little further, you're going to see things in here from Elias Haskett Derby. You, got, you could have seen what the things were that they were ordering. Lots of tea, lots of uh, textiles, Nankins they were known as. Um, there's also a lot of uh, porcelain on here, early China trade porcelain, um, uh, uh, and all kinds of stuff. Just great stuff. But you'll notice on here, there's, a, there's, this, there's the signature of the designer, Elias Haskett Derby. And Elias Haskett Derby, within a very short time of this being done, um, his involvement, he ended up being a major China trade merchant, and he also became America's first millionaire. He was the wealthiest man in America by far. Um, um, uh, it was a fascinating story. Derby Wharf in Salem, of course, was named after him. Um, here he's listed as uh, uh, you know, Boston and then to Salem. He, he operated out of both places. 
uh, and there's all kinds of the Parkman uh, family, uh, the Dodge family, all all the uh, well-known uh, uh, players of the day were on here. The Siemens, uh, Edmund and John Seaman, both. Um, and the Siemens family uh, were uh, an, another one of these big families. There's a signature from Dodge. All this stuff. This is a great document. Really, really great document. And I, I suspect it either went to a, 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 an institution or uh, went to uh, you know a, a collector who's going to give it to an institution at some point, I suspect. Uh, but this was the document. Very, very long, full of information and uh, historic in that it was so early in America's uh, entrance into the China trade, 1790, and ended up selling for $16,000. Um, uh, absolutely fascinating thing. Uh, the the Estrella, Estrella was the, uh, captained by John McGee, James McGee, who was uh, notably one of the very first China trade captains and uh, supercargos and so forth that handled trade um, in China, and uh, you know what a thing that was. All right, now uh, what what else is going on here? Oh, Rafael Osana's auction. This is an interesting little exercise here. Uh, Rafael Osana. I don't know if you know Rafael. He operates an auction house on Nantucket. And those of you been to Nantucket know what Nantucket. Nantucket is basically, uh, when I was a kid, we used to go there and, and we would bicycle around the island and stay at little inns. It was just this quaint. Um, um, offshore island uh, for, for uh, uh, you know seeing New England. It was just it was just a regular port. It wasn't it wasn't as prominent as Martha's Vineyard was at the time. Martha's Vineyard was it was much closer to Cape Cod uh, and was was a big summer haunt. A lot of wealthy people went there, and um, and then when when Martha's Vineyard it didn't become passe, but it it lost a little bit of its luster because uh, it got too touristy. Uh, a lot of rich people started buying houses on Nantucket in the in the 70s and into the 80s and 90s. And uh, uh, there's, they have a, one of the busiest airports in, in the eastern United States for private planes, not unsurprisingly. I read one where once uh, they said, uh, I think in the, the two weeks around the 4th of July, five to 7,000 private jets land and take off from, from Nantucket. Uh, and and I, I think that's probably true. But at any rate, they have this big captive audience there in the summer, a lot of yachts, and Rafael Osana runs auctions in the middle of that. And uh, the people down there that buy these enormous houses for you know millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars these days, um, uh, go to these auctions to furnish their houses. And a lot of dealers save up their stuff to consign to Raphael uh, for his summer sales, and this is why. All right, you, because you, you, you have a pr pretty solid uh, minimum price that things are going to sell for because it's just so much wealth at these. I've been to Raphael's auctions and they are quite an event. It's like the Hamptons, only uh, with what maybe wealthier people, if that's possible. But uh, uh, it's it's quite fantastic, and uh, things like this: a nice pair of Dowsai late 19th century covered food pots, twenty five hundred dollars. All right, pretty good price. And uh, then you hop over. This is just a look at some of his auctions. Um, here's some of the some of the items that you're likely to find, find at a Raphael Osana auction: uh, American furniture, Chinese furniture, and uh, New England paintings. There were paintings in here from uh, Gloucester artists, uh, uh, Emile Groupe uh, paintings, and and so forth. And uh, they did they did fairly well. One of them didn't sell. I don't know why, but the other two brought you know nine ten thousand dollars a piece, that kind of thing. But when you got into the uh, Chinese export. Um, the prices were, were quite substantial, and, you, and everybody knows people in general. The Canton market has been pretty quiet for the last few years, and I know dealers that buy get Canton. They buy collections out of old houses, and they often don't know what to do with them uh, because it's, it's it's there's not a huge market for them anymore because a lot of collectors that used to buy Canton and and, and that kind of thing have migrated on to other forms, earlier forms of export porcelain. Uh, and, and, and that kind of, you know, they've, they've sort of matured. Well, on Nantucket, uh, people that have all these old New England, you know, it was famous for whaling and, and, and marine trade. It was, a, it was a big marine trade base, especially whaling. A lot of wealth from the whaling industry at one point there. <clears throat> and uh, things like China Trade Canton sell just fine there. 
because they're still interested in them. They, they, they go well with the houses. There's a, 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 a decorative thing. And there's, a, a, again, um, unlimited money to spend. So you have things like this, a, a China tra trade Canton uh, jug uh, that's been clobbered, uh, pr probably clobbered in, in, in England or someplace, clobberware. And, uh, you know, these don't always do that well. Clobberware isn't always that popular. Well, um, this this had an estimate of three to five thousand dollars, which was I think a little bit aggressive, but uh, apparently not a big reserve. And uh, the, the but it sold for still brought twenty seven hundred and fifty dollars, which is about two or three times what you would get elsewhere for that for that piece of porcelain in today's market. And the same thing goes for this. Even more money. Uh, a chestnut basket. We've all seen them. This one was clobbered, nicely clobbered, beautifully beautiful quality. Um, uh, but they generally don't sell, you know, in the auction market um, for huge amounts of money because they're clobbered. They, you know, they, a, a chestnut basket like this might bring, you know, thirteen or fourteen hundred dollars in a regular auction. Here it brought thirty-two hundred and fifty. All right, and this is the uh, starting to get the point. Here's a, bo a box of five graduated Canton boxes, nineteenth century. Nothing exceptional about them, um, and they're not even. They're, it's an assembled. A, a bit of it's an assembled set. Uh, this in this box looked like they came from somewhere else. So somebody assembled a set of graduated uh, China trade Canton porcelain boxes, and they brought six thousand dollars. Which is a breathtaking amount of money for that. I thought the three to four thousand dollar estimate was sky high. Uh, in other other places, if you go to an auction where they have these things in the in the Midwest or in California or somewhere else, a set of boxes like this would probably go for under a thousand dollars. At Raphael Asana's in, in in August, the height of summer, six thousand dollars probably because somebody just wanted them to put on their counter in their house and they had the wherewithal to chase it. Same thing here. You have a small pair of strap-handled uh, early 19th century Canton pitchers. Um, um, a little bit of a rare form, but nothing extraordinary. And they're not huge. These are not big pitchers. Um, these are, uh, how big are they? What are they? Uh, six, uh, eight inches tall. It's fairly small. The two of them went for $2,000. And, and many of you can just see these <clears throat> being sold somewhere else and bringing $450, $500. And you'd say, yeah, that's fine. That's plenty for that. But in, in, in Nantucket, Canton wares are uh, still hot stuff. Here's a, a very common oval wire-handled uh, Canton uh, vegetable uh, pot with cover, um, $800. All right. And here's another one of these clobbered meat platters. Nice looking, very good quality, early, 20th century, early 19th century with a bit of gilt clobbering around the outside. Uh, ended up selling for $2,250. And uh, in the past, I've seen these on eBay, and they bring uh, maybe six fifty. All right. So th what I'm saying is that this is a, a great way to, uh, if you've got some Canton and it's or good fits you, it's particularly good quality, get it down to Rafael Alsana and have them sell it early in the sale. And the reason I say that is if you go through that catalog, through that auction result, and you take the time, you, as you get later into the day, um, a, a, a wealthy auction attendee who sometimes don't have great attention spans, and uh, by 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 mid afternoon or so, they're getting a little weary. Time to go for a drink, uh, time to take the boat out, you know, a little sunset sail on the yacht, and uh, the crowd thinned out, and the prices of Canton came down to more realistic level, more normal levels. Not maybe realistic, because it's still. Uh, fairly strong for for, for, for for what the things are. But um, uh, when you have an auction that's catering to, uh, you know, very wealthy people, uh, they often get tired of being there after a f a three or four hours. And they go, well, I'm going to go do something else now. I'm on vacation. And they leave and then the prices just drop. So the dealers hang around until the end and pick up the bits because there's going to be some good deals coming in late in the sale. But you, you really could see, you can really feel it. You can see the audience thin out. I was there one sale and... Uh, it started, I think it, uh, uh, it was either started at 10.30 or 11 in the morning. And it had a huge crowd at the start, big crowd. It was unbelievable. They served lunch and all this other stuff. And, uh, you know, people brought picnic baskets with, you know, cocktails mixed and all that fancy stuff. And uh, by the sale had a good ways to go at around 3 o'clock. And they had lost probably half their crowd. 
and then the prices got reasonable. <laughs> But uh, it's just it's just a little lesson about marketing, I guess, is that uh, there's always a market somewhere. If you take the time to figure it out and go to the effort to get it there, um, you'll get rewarded for it most of the time. But like I said, if you if you can sign to an auction like this that caters to a summer crowd, a, a wealthy summer crowd, uh, try to get the stuff sold in the first three hour, two hours of the sale. Uh, because it, it can thin out after that, and there aren't that many dealers on Nantucket. That's the other thing is that there are or there are D antique dealers on Nantucket, but not many dealers bother to take the four-hour ferry boat ride to get there um, from Cape Cod. So uh, um, if you if you are hap if you do happen to be there, you could do you could do pretty well. All right, and they do do antique shows on uh, Nantucket as well. So if if you if you're in, you think it's just getting on the show circuit. Uh, Nantucket in the summer is definitely a place you want to do antique shows. All right, it's a little expensive, but boy, um, they do some business. All right, and then this, this was also in the sale. I wanted to point this out. I thought this was just such a pretty vase, this big Celadon uh, Famille Rose vase, first half of the 19th century, uh, 24 inches tall, beautiful quality, uh, really, really lovely, all the way down. The enamels were in good shape. And it got a strong price. It brought $4,000. It actually went over the estimate. The estimate was very low on this for some reason. I don't know why. $1,000 to $1,500, uh, uh, which I think was, you know, it may have come out of an estate and they didn't care what it brought. They're just trying to clean it up. But at any rate, the crowd took over and it once again proves estimates don't always mean much. And I uh, went for 4000 which isn't a crazy price. We've seen that price before for these, you know, the, these big, these big uh, early uh, Famille Rose Celadons for the export market often bring um, um, in the in the in, in the 24 inch and in up range will bring, uh, you know, pretty steadily 3000 to 5000 dollars a piece. So even on Nantucket, they, they still get those kinds of prices. All right. So uh, um, again, the global pages have been busy, and uh, uh, this was an interesting sale. Uh, if you if you like to follow auctions and you enjoy the enjoy the, uh, the the action and the results and who's there and all that sort of thing, it's kind of fun. All righty, now uh, incidentally, one of the best pieces of porcelain I ever bought, I bought at Nantucket. It's a, a big Ming jar. Uh, it's sort of a strange story. <clears throat> I, uh, I, was, I was down there um, uh, 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 checking the shows and going to a Raphael's auction and there was an antique shop on the pier and uh, on the waterfront right where they keep all the, all the big yachts, all the huge boats are down there. And uh, I, I, in the showroom window of this antique shop right there, right on Main Street, uh, was this big blue and white Ming jar with, a, with fitted as a table lamp. And uh, I went inside to see what the, uh, 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 the dealer wanted for it. And uh, he, he said, he said, he said, well, it's really not for sale. I got the, I got it. It came out of, he told me it came from a, a very prominent summer resident family that were closing out one of their houses. And uh, he got it to sell, but he took, the woman that gave it to her, the, the elderly lady that owned it said, I don't want you to sell it because Christie's is co coming out to look at it because they might want it for an auction. And I said, well, I said, how long ago was that? And he goes, well, it was like a month ago, and I haven't heard from Christie's. They're probably not going to come out because it's a long ride, you know, that kind of thing. And he said, but I don't know what to do. And I said, oh, well, I said, here's my card. If she changes her mind, uh, give me a call. And he said, you know what? Why don't you talk to her? And I said, oh, is she here? And he goes, no. And he called, he called her on the phone. And she was in Washington. That's where she, she lives most of the time. She happened to be back home. And I got her on the phone, and she... I said, listen, I'm a dealer. I'm in the store. And I said, do you have a price for this jar? And she says, uh, uh, well, no, I'm, you know, I think it's, it's Ming Dynasty. It's this, it's that, um, you know, and I said, okay. And she says, what would you, what would you pay for it? And I gave her a price and uh, she said, put the guy's name, I think it was John. He's put John on the phone and she gave him permission for me to, to buy it. And I bought it. I still own it. And uh, that was, that was the story, but it's one of those odd things um, that, that can happen on Nantucket. Things can be in stores and they're not really for sale until somebody throws out some money and then suddenly it's for sale, like so many things in the world. But uh, uh, I, I like Nantucket a lot, but it's, it has gotten a little bit a little bit on the trendy side. Is, is, what did what Graham, um, Graham Gund, the, the architect, one, or I.M. Pei, I think it was, I.M. Pei, I think it was, called it a, uh, uh, called it a, a theme park. <laughs> All right. Anyway, we carry on. Uh, here we have something. This was Mark Wahlberg. This is the eBay auctions. Uh, Mark Wahlberg had this very nice um, bronze, gilt bronze, um, foulain belt buckle. 
Uh, this is a, quite an attractive thing, and, and Mark is very sharp on this stuff. Mark, Mark's been a dealer for a long time. Um, 18th, early 19th century bell hook, Foo Lion Dogs, uh, sold for $539. These were quite attractive. Um, and I, I think they went a little bit low because there's a lot of fakes of these around. But um, I, I, I've, from this, my, 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 my observances and having dealt with um, Mark a few times, at, uh, it's on sunlink.net. Uh, he is extremely knowledgeable. He's been a dealer for a very long time and uh, uh, is uh, quite sharp on Japanese material. Did a lot of work with the old Flying Crane Gallery in New York when they were in business. He had quite a reputation. He was a good dealer. And uh, he had these, and, and I, I thought these were quite nice. Uh, I hope one of you maybe bought these. These were, these were, these were very attractive looking. All right, now um, on to here, a rank, uh, this was one of another one of these uh, fifth or sixth rank uh, badges came up, uh, nice colors, very nice soft pastel colors. We talked about it a little bit last week because I thought it was graphically uh, quite, quite entrancing. I thought this was a nice looking piece of silk. And again, silk has remained very, very vibrant and uh, went uh, for $1,975, which is, which is fine. <clears throat> I think we mentioned it last week or the week before, and we thought it might bring, uh, you know, 1500 or so, sort of in that range, and, and it did. Um, uh, they had it dated as 18th or 19th century. Um, I think most likely it was 19th century, but uh, still a really, really nice piece of silk. And then this, the uh, the Kangxi uh, Wukai uh, rose water bottle that had the silver top added to it. I thought this was quite nice. Um, you know, Kangxi period, uh, typical base to one of these. They, all, they often built them like this. Not always, but often. And I uh, went for $344. It was a pretty good buy. And uh, as we've been saying for the last couple of weeks, with all the turmoil in the world and concerns about the stock markets and, of course, all the insanity in our own country and the Taiwan problem and the Hong Kong issue, all this. I think there's a little bit of uh, uh, money pulling back in, uh, out of uh, China and other places uh, to, to, to buy art right now. Periods of instability create opportunities. Um, and it just requires a little bit of patience. And um, uh, I, think, I think you're gonna be able to get some good buys because I, I do feel that uh, uh, a year and a half ago, this, this bottle vase, this uh, rose water bottle sprinkler probably would have brought closer to 500. And, and now it's at 344. All right, and then this. This is a, a nifty painting. This is an ink painting. Um, uh, it was up uh, uh, before and it didn't get any bids. I forget how he advertised it. But this is a nice uh, thing. It's, it's done sort of in the, in the Sung literati style of, of uh, ink drawing. It wasn't in perfect condition. There were some tears and some bends and folds and whatnot. But I think it's a pretty old painting, appears to be and uh, uh, ended up selling for just uh, seven bids of $75. And I think this was a really, really, really good buy. It was sold by a dealer, um, it was a Junk Slingers, what a username, Junk Slingers. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's, it's not a very good way to compliment yourself, is it? Anyway, um, it, it sold for just $75, a nifty painting, probably 18th or 19th century. I think this was a very nice buy, sweet looking picture. Very, very sweet. All righty. And he had it up. It didn't sell uh, a few weeks ago. It was up, or a week or two ago, it was up, and it, 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 we had an opening bid of 50 bucks. didn't get a single bid. And uh, then he relisted it, and, and uh, we put it on the pages here, and this time it sold for $75, framed and ready to go. The frame would cost you 150 bucks, so it's a, it's a heck of a deal for somebody who ever bought it. And then on to this, we had numerous inquiries about this plate uh, because it's 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 obviously done. And for those of you who've seen a lot of these these deer plates, uh, deer pattern with the mountains is a, is a style of decoration that started in the Kangxi period, the Qinlong period, rather. Excuse me, and they did them on plates, and they in particular did them on uh, Chan Chu Bing's the the bottle vases, right? And uh, they, they've always painted them. They've always been very popular uh, from the Qinlong period onward. And as, they, as, they, as the periods progressed, we actually did a video on it once talking about the way these mountains are drawn, these, these very angular looking mountains. And in the 18th century, they were a bit more fluid and not quite so stiff, a bit looser. And as time went on, the, the, the pattern got stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. So you end up with these very... Um, um, rather striking angular rock rocky uh, 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 outcroppings instead of being sort of all flowing together the way the way they did on the early ones 
still had the spotted deer and the pine trees and so forth. And what was interesting about this was the pine needles on, on this tree are sort of a, uh, a, 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 a sort of a, a bluish green. And then this tree looks like a pine tree, but it looks like it has regular leaves on it, which is sort of a curious combination. Any rate, uh, this was a nice platter and it was good size. It was, what was it? It was 17 or 18 inches or something. I forget. Let me get over. I, can't, I never read the rulers upside down online. Um, <laughs> um, let me see here. Uh, he doesn't say what the size is. Darn it. Why are people so lazy? Uh, hold on a second. If you're going to go to the trouble of putting something online, don't do this to rely on for the measurements. Just include the measurements. Uh, 19 inches. Big plate. Big plate. Anyway, had a lot of interest and ended up doing very well. It ended up selling for $3,250. Uh, but unusual, probably Guangxu period, um, possibly early Republic, but most likely Guangxu. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's hard to say, uh, you know, you, um, because, the, because they didn't change much from one to the other. And curiously, it had spur marks on it. And, and some people were wondering, if that does that mean that it's uh, a Japanese? And uh, because the Japanese were most notable for using spur marks on everything. But the Chinese, as I've said before, they occasionally use them on very big pieces if it, especially if the piece was expensive, even then, even in the late Qing Dynasty, these were expensive plates because they were so big. And they stood a, a, a bit of a chance of collapsing where the, where the bottom of it would sag in the kiln and hit the, hit the ground and get stuck. So they, even here, they decided to throw some spurs on it. But uh, uh, the, the foot rim, all of it looks very consistent with late Qing to Republic workmanship. And it did very well, $3,250. Uh, but a nice, nice piece of porcelain. So um, to those five or six of you that sent me inquiries about it, I hope one of you got it. All right, and now on to this. This was that silk needlework that I just liked. It wasn't extremely old or anything, but it was sweetly done, and it was done as very much, again, in the sort of the, 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 the naturalistic sort of literati style that you see in paintings of birds on branches. That, you know, sometimes you see them from paintings in the Song Dynasty, the Ming Dynasty, and so forth. And here it is on silk done probably during the second half of the 19th century or so. Uh, nice looking little picture. Ended up selling for $405, which is a good buy. That was a nice thing. Um, it didn't have any staining on it. It was already framed, ready to go, uh, and, and beautifully worked. Simply and beautifully worked. Uh, but nice shading of the leaves. If you look at the way the leaves were done um, on here, you'll notice that they, the, the weaver actually managed to put some shading in as though the light was hitting it. And, and that's a really a difficult, difficult thing to pull off. All right. Now, over here to this, this was sort of one of the great little buys of the week. I like Chinese metalwork in particular of all kinds. And this was a little lobed pactong tray with two ladies seated in a garden with a balustrade around them. Very classical scene. You see it in paintings on porcelain. You see it on, on paintings on, you know, on silk and paper and all kinds of things. And here it is on uh, a, a piece of pactong. Um, which is a, a, a metal alloy, um, sort of, uh, uh, um, it's not silver, it's, it's a high nickel content uh, metal that is very similar to silver in appearance at times. And this was a, a really good piece of pectong from what I can see. Uh, it looks excellent. And uh, had a little bit of a repair on one side. Sold for just 68 pounds or $83. This was a seller over in the UK. Um, I don't know the seller particularly. Bow Boston Antiques. And they're in the United Kingdom. But at any rate, that was a nice little tray. And it wasn't terribly big. Um, what was it? Uh, was it 17 centimeters. So about uh, 7 inches in diameter. But very attractive. Very good workmanship. Just a, a nice, nice, nice old example. Uh, so somebody got a great buy. That was a good buy. And then this, the 18th century uh, relief work, uh, Famil Rose uh, teapot and under tray. And uh, this looked like a pretty good deal. Uh, uh, the, 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 there wasn't a lot of damage to the pedals. Often on these things, as I said last week, you'll see the pedals on these, these, these areas here, because this is all in relief overlaid on the porcelain. Get, they often get chipped and worn and banged up pretty badly. Uh, this one looked like it was in quite good condition. Uh, there's a bottom of the pot. And somebody picked up the tray, the under tray and the teapot 
for just eight hundred dollars, and that was a heck of a good buy, uh, because we've seen in the past we've had we've had that teapot alone on here, and that with that kind of work on it, and we've seen them sell for um, uh, fourteen hundred to sixteen hundred dollars. This one with the under trade sold for eight hundred. So um, I, I I know whoever bought it know they got a great buy. And then this this uh, very fine English armorial uh, gilt and sepia uh, or gilt and grisaille decorated cup and saucer. Nice, nice, nice uh, example. And uh, the uh, the enameling and, and the gilding look to be in quite good condition because this kind of gilding is, is always worn off to pieces, uh, nearly always. And if you have Howard's book, I spe suspect you can look this up. They have it dated to 1740, so late Young Chen, early Chen Lung period. $300 for it. That was a good buy. That was a nice, nice thing. Nice thing. And uh, then down here to this was this uh, 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 Kangxi period. They said it may be Ming, Kangxi period, bowl. Unusual pattern. It had some damage to it, but I put it in there just because I thought it was so pretty as an example. And maybe if, if, if somebody isn't in a position to spend, you know, 1500 or 2000 bucks for a bowl, they could buy this because it, it ended up selling for just 500 which I think is a little more than I thought it would bring given its condition. But it was beautifully decorated and it's this style of decoration. These these pieces with this this type of decoration, this pattern always get interest. They always have interest because they have a lot of aspects that are reminiscent to old Ming wares and transitional wares and so forth and was probably made uh, prior to uh, 1700. But nice looking, nice looking piece of porcelain, you know, even even though it's damaged. What the heck? All right. Now, what else is going on here? Oh, what's coming up? Uh, there's a few things coming up this week. Uh, just go through them really quickly. One of them is this. You may remember a week or so ago, there was a miniature bottle, a little miniature vase that brought, uh, I think, a couple of thousand dollars. We talked about it. This is the same seller again. It's got this one. It's a little uh, miniature May Ping vase with um, a, a, a copper red glaze on it. Lang Yao, or, or yeah, Lang, I guess it's sort of like Lang Yao, copper red, almost peach bloom in places. But here it is, nice looking bottom on it. Late 18th, early 19th century, probably. Uh, good example. Very, very nice. Sweet, little, small vase. This closes this week. It's It's got 19 bids. It closes Monday. It's up to $380. Probably is going to triple that by the time it's done. We'll see. We'll check back next week on it, see how it did. All right. And then this is a nice uh, 18th century. Um, they, they call it a, Ro a Ro Rockefeller pattern. Um, I don't think it really is, but it's a nice Chinese export uh, 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 plate with an with a, with a interior and exterior scene in this uh, sweet scene with a, a mom with her baby and um, some nice furniture. I like, I like looking at the furnishings in these pictures, see how, they, how well they get depicted. Um, and again, you, you, that, that painting that we saw earlier, the one that uh, is at the uh, Lynn Wood sale, again, had this very similar theme, the vase with the peacock feathers and the coral coming out of it. And that was a very popular motif combination that you often see in Chinese paintings. Um, uh, they, they love peacock feathers. Uh, they, they even did robes and silk with them and so forth. And then this, this is a, a nice Chinese but khaki amon, sort of a khaki amon pattern uh, plate, uh, but, but it has this uh, scroll device here. Let's see, this is like a scroll that's been rolled out across the plate, revealing this tree. It's a clever, clever uh, uh, way to do it. But I love the um, the uh, sort of craggy uh, 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 trees uh, that they, the, the artist put in around the border around here with gilding on, on these flowers and then this nice uh, sort of khaki amon pattern that you often see on early very fine Japanese wares. Here, here they are, they've been adopted by, by a, uh, a, a, an 18th century uh, Chinese uh, maker. But quite nice, it's up to $98, should bring three or 400, but we'll see, may bring more. All right, and now this. This is interesting. This is a, a, a rather striking set. This uh, uh, pot with uh, uh, silver handles. This is China Trade, uh, circa 1770, export stuff. Here we go. And they've applied this uh, beautiful silver mount and this very nicely done and unusual form uh, pitcher. Uh, with, the, with, with this shape, with the faceted sides and sort of an open landscape scene, lots of gilding, and it, it comes with, um, there's the top of it, looks like a pretty good shape, 
um, comes with this this uh, under tray or, or basin to put it in. And this is very nice. This is absolutely great. Uh, nice orange peel on it. Again, 1770s, uh, but very, very fine. And it's a comp they go together. And it has an opening bid of $2,800, which is a little bit aggressive. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if it got there or if it even got a little bit higher than that. Because this this is a, 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 one of the pattern. The patterns are rare. These are rare patterns. All right, are unusual patterns executed in this form. All right, so it, it drives the price. And uh, this is a nice looking thing. And um, if you go looking around in England for a few months and hit some of the major shops, you may find one of these. But if you found this, this combination in a f fancy gallery in London or up on Madison Avenue in New York, it's, it's gonna be eight or $10,000 probably. Uh, but at any rate, here it is. Uh, 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 Philip Coburn has it, twenty-eight hundred dollars uh, uh, starting bid. And um, if one of you wants to jump into it, I don't think you'll be disappointed. You'll pay some money for it, but boy, it's a nice-looking combination of things. Shipping isn't bad either. It's hundred and a quarter a year uh, in the U.S. And then you have this carved nut coming up. I like this. I don't know who this seller is. I think it's a fairly new seller. Um, uh, Nafos 10, where, whoever they are, they're, they're located in uh, Foley, Alabama. Um, but they have this rather nice naturalistically carved nut, which is something that you, you, you do find. Um, and they carved beetle nuts and they carved ivory. He's got several things up. There's small, these little bits, but very nice quality. Very, very nice quality um, with this land, figure in a landscape scene in the foreground. Um, Here's the figure here, and the, he's looking up across this valley. Uh, I really like this. This is a nice little thing. And here's one. Here's a balustrade, and somebody's standing on the edge looking out over a bay. There's a boat in the background. Absolutely charming. That's a great thing. Something You could carry that around in your pocket. Anyway, it's just one up. It's got nine days to go. It's got a single bid of $9 so far. Um, I hope he doesn't pull it and get discouraged because he's a new seller. Sometimes new sellers do that. But uh, that's a nice thing. That that should sell for three or $400, I would expect. And then this. This is a, a, a fan fitting. Um, and I, I don't know where he got this. This is the same seller. Uh, a, a pretty nice one. His, his photographs are a little bit blurry. But this is where it goes. If, you, if, you, if you're familiar with how they built fans, they would at the, at the base have this, this, uh, this fitting on here to help pull it all together where the center spike goes into the middle of it and so forth. And here's a look inside of it and so forth. So this got stripped off of an old fan and it is, it is rather nice. It's got vines and double gourd uh, um, carvings in it and it is ivory, uh, but we won't tell anyone, okay? But it's clearly a uh, early, probably early 19th century fitting, possibly late 18th century and very nice quality and uh, is up to just 1050 it's had two bids it's 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 obviously got nine days to go should bring again th that should bring four or five hundred dollars it's a it's a pretty unusual uh, uh, a, a part of a fan you don't often find leftover fan fittings like that so it makes it sort of interesting if you're an ivory collector or a carving collector uh, pretty good thing pretty good thing all right and uh, that's about it for the week um, um, I think next week you're going to see a lot more stuff online. I hope hope so. I like seeing more stuff come out. Um, uh, the global pages have been getting fuller and fuller. The European side is getting stuff. There's some good rugs and textiles, some Chinese rugs, some Central Asian rugs and textiles right now on the global pages. Um, not many of those things. If you like those things, you're not going to find them very often on eBay anymore. Uh, most of the people that sell rugs and textiles on eBay, if it's any good, they put a fixed price on it because they, 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 they don't want to risk uh, the, the auction world on them. So um, um, it, it's a f funny psychology. But at any rate, um, Austrian rug company's got a sale up. There's a sale coming up in the U.S. Um, on the U.S. pages that has some good things, some good, some good rugs and carpets, textiles, sil silver. Don't forget the uh, Skinner Silver auction is tomorrow, with Chinese silver and uh, all that. So anyway, it's a good week. Uh, let's see, what else do I have to say? I think that's about it. Uh, have a great weekend, and uh, if you haven't subscribed yet here, please do. We do these every week. Um, sometimes we, we get two a week. We've gotten a little a little behind this summer because we got some things going on, and um, we're going to try and get a second video out next week. Uh, we had hoped to do it this week, but I didn't get all the information together in time uh, to put it to put it together and edit it and get it cleaned up. So, um, I'm, but we're working on it. And uh, have a great week. Have a great rest of your summer. Um, go to the beach. 
And uh, I'll see you all next week. And leave a comment. Leave, always leave comments. We love to read them. And um, uh, give us a thumbs up if you like them. It helps us with the, the YouTube algorithm. Uh, apparently that's a big deal to get thumbs ups. So uh, anyway, thanks for watching. And uh, see you all next week. Bye-bye.